Hello, we are back. Uh, thank you for your patience. So we are back on the um, API-driven regulation uh, conference uh, with uh, uh, on the track on API-driven um, uh, business models. And now we have our second speaker, Asanka uh, from WSO2. Hello, Asanka. How are you? Hi, Mehdi. I'm doing good. How are you? Yeah, I'm doing really well. Hello, we are back. Oh, uh, uh, I'm doing really well. Questions. Sorry. Uh, uh, and yes, and the, the thing is, um, you will be talking with us about the reconstitution of middleware with APIs. Quite an interesting topic, especially in the world where actually we have to open API through a regulation. So what does that have? What does uh, happen behind the scene? So the stage is yours for 20 minutes and we'll be back for questions. Thank you, Mary. Uh... Let me share my screen first. Okay, hope you can see my screen. Uh, yes, can you go full screen? Yep. That's perfect. See you in 20 minutes. Okay. Yep, thank you. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Uh, so as Mehdi mentioned, so I'm going to talk about the reconciliation of middleware with APIs. Uh, so I work for WSO2. WSO2 is a technology company uh, that we have API management, integration, and uh, identity and access management products uh, that runs on-prem as well as uh, in cloud environments. And uh, we are coming from open source roots, uh, so you can download our products uh, uh, without any issue. And if you are interested about WSO2, you can go to the URL that I have put in uh, the right corner of my uh, slide. So this is a quick introduction about myself. Uh, what I want to highlight here, I was working uh, in the middleware space for a while. Uh, so uh, uh, that's uh, just to claim that uh, how qualified I am uh, to talk about this topic. And uh, currently I'm working as the chief uh, technology evangelist and telling the WS2 story, uh, coming from a strong technical background, I worked in product engineering as well as product uh, uh, architecture for a long time. So this is how I'm going to structure the next 20 minutes before we jump into the uh, Q&A session. Uh, so intro is done. So I'll give a small background about uh, what really happened in the middleware uh, uh, market and a little bit deep dive into middleware. Most of you uh, might aware about middleware, but if not, it might be helpful. Then uh, let's uh, take a look at what's really happening in the uh, uh, market today uh, from the architecture point of view, as well as uh, uh, in the cloud technologies. Uh, then we will spend a significant amount of time connecting the dots, like how API is helping uh, in this transition and what's the role of uh, APIs uh, in the same context as well. And at the end, I'll tell a little bit about the contribution that uh, we have done uh, for this uh, specific uh, area. So uh, I'll go to the beginning and I'm going back to uh, February 1997. Uh, so that was uh, when I started my career as a uh, software engineer. So this was my first day at work. So I got interviewed um, uh, to be a uh, Visual Basic programmer on Microsoft side, but when I enter that uh, software house, what I saw is a Wang VS, and the engineering manager uh, who I was reporting to gave me a manual of uh, COBOL books, and that was a product called Microfocus, and it was not the raw COBOL; it it's called the Object COBOL. And same time, he gave me a, a set of floppy disks that uh, to install. Microfocus COBOL in a Windows machine. So I was really uh, disappointed because this is what uh, this is not what I expected. On the same week, I got invited to a small architecture meeting with the chief architect of this uh, software house. And uh, we were discussing about a new uh, uh, way of handling a certain uh, uh, product related uh, evolution that they are planning to do. So what they were planning to do change from the traditional uh, Kabul programming and move to a new uh, paradigm with uh, Visual Basics. So, but they had to use the existing 
Kabul runtimes, Kabul data. Uh, so they were looking for a solution and they asked me to start a R&D project uh, to uh, find a solution to combine these uh, different elements. So we were working on this project and I was leading this. Uh, so what we did, we took the object Kabul and then identify a way to connect to the ISAM databases, uh, which stored all the uh, business data. And uh, we were playing with uh, Visual Basics and uh, Object Kabul on how to communicate. And the requirement we had, we will be installing these uh, uh, server-side components in a server and uh, the uh, client applications in uh, every uh, personal computer, typical uh, client server architecture with the three tier model. And the most challenging part was how the visual basic UI communicate with the business objects generated by the uh, Microsoft Microfocus object Kabul. So we tried with uh, OLE, OLE2, COM, DCOM, COM plus, and we ended with uh, picking DCOM as the way that the Visual Basic uh, UI will uh, communicate with the uh, Microfocus package. So it was a success. Then uh, during that uh, period, it was just a POC. And I was uh, uh, assigned for a new job uh, to create this middleware factory, uh, because if you notice the previous R&D project, it was not easy uh, for a person to go through all these uh, nitty gritties and then create a seamless flow uh, from data to screen, uh, because there are a lot of uh, additional stuff that they had to do uh, while they are working on the business logic. So what uh, the, the this project basically uh, uh, targeting to create set of middleware that the application developers can generate code from one side, as well as application developers will get shared libraries for the common usage, like uh, how they can log in, how they can log certain stuff, and then how they do the data connection, uh, so and so forth. So the uh, code generation part ha had three uh, sections. One is the preprocessor uh, that uh, helps to identify some of the low level elements. And then there's a business object generation. Those days it's about object orientation that you create business objects for each and every entity that you have in the data side and there are data access modules. So uh, this is how uh, the middleware, uh, how I touched the middleware and then uh, I got into middleware during my first uh, uh, job. So let's uh, take a look at what is middleware because there are many definitions. Uh, so I'm going to fast forward the time a bit to July 2014. Uh, so uh, I was living next to uh, Levi Stadium in Santa Clara, California, and the opening uh, happened uh, in July. Uh, but the first game played in this stadium in, uh, I think, September 23rd versus uh, Chicago Bears. Uh, so, uh, uh, so it was a football game happened in this stadium. And after some time, I noticed there were there was a, a, a motocross event happening in the same event, uh, same venue, and a different type of people joined this uh, particular event as well. Then after a while, I noticed and I heard some noise or a sound coming from uh, the stadium side, and I heard Coldplay is playing inside the stadium. So uh, what I noticed the same stadium is creating a platform for different people to perform. In an example, in the first uh, example, in 49ers, Kaepernick did uh, his performance. And then uh, the second one, uh, let's say, Lai Tomac, who is a, a famous motocross rider. And then in the third case, Chris Martin, who's the lead singer in Coldplay, uh, did the uh, performance. So it, it is basically providing these type of people to or for a team to do the performance by creating an infrastructure and change it based on the event. And ultimately what it is doing, it is connecting an exam experience with the 
performer and the audience. So same analogy we can apply for uh, middleware as well. And if you uh, Google uh, for middleware, uh, you can find many definitions. But I uh, found it interesting what Wikipedia is telling. What it tells, it's basically creating the, the a software layer, but it is basically uh, gluing other software. So that's exactly what middleware is doing. It is connecting different type of components in a distributed or a non-distributed environment. And it is doing uh, a huge role uh, for the developers because uh, developers don't have to work on these uh, underneath complexity that they will find when it comes to software development. And I think those underneath components are really complicated today that we will be discussing at the uh, end of the, uh, I mean, the latter part of the presentation. And it is allowing, the middleware is allowing the developers or the application developers to focus on the business logic and give more and more uh, better experience for the end users rather than they spend time on uh, try to resolve these problems that they find in the uh, underneath infrastructure. So that is a, a really good definition of software, uh, middleware. And if you look at middleware, there are many uh, types of middleware that you will see. Most uh, common and famous uh, part is the message-oriented middleware that is coming with the communication. And then there are object-oriented middleware that connects different type of objects inside the uh, your uh, applications and uh, remote procedure calls, especially when it comes to uh, distributed systems, RPC calls are really helpful. And uh, there are a bunch of database related middleware as well that is providing the data storage, data retrieval, and many other operations related to data. Then the transaction related middleware uh, there as well that is helping to do different type of transactions as well as taking uh, business value through uh, the wire. And uh, the portal related technologies are really useful because you can't just build a portal from scratch. So the portal middleware provides a framework that a developer can build a portal uh, in a quick interval without uh, putting much effort to uh, resolve how the data connectivity, how the notifications, how uh, the login happens inside the portal. Then there are embedded uh, middleware as well that you can run within the code. And uh, there are content-centric middleware that is really useful uh, for content generation, publications, uh, so and so forth. So those are the main categories of middleware that you will find in the industry. So I'm switching back uh, to fall 2008 to uh, share some of uh, my experience again. In fall 2008, we uh, at WSO2 actually, we did a really interesting project to take the middleware into next level and make it a more modular middleware. So if you have worked on uh, different kind of middleware runtimes, you might have noticed that you are not using the entire runtime provided by that particular middleware uh, uh, product. Or sometimes you might require to add additional uh, capabilities into your runtime. So you had to do customization. So as a solution for this thing, what we did uh, use this uh, nice Java framework called OSGI uh, during that time, and then create a, a module, a, a set of middleware modules that you can create products. So out of that, we managed to create uh, 23 products uh, by assembling these different components and the users of uh, this middleware stack, they created many other products as well by using this adding and removing features from a runtime. So it was a, uh, a kind of a great way to handle uh, the end user requirements as well as provide only the required features for a specific organization or a team to use middleware. So it was kind of uh, uh, the next uh, wave of the middleware that we contributed. So let's look at what's really happening today with the architecture and uh, what's the role of middleware in the uh, current context. So if you look at today, uh, so the architecture has changed a lot. 
and uh, if you can uh, see the traditional way of uh, using systems or building systems it's more centralized and then you have this layered architecture so still organizations are using layered architecture i'm not telling it's completely wrong because there are many regulations there are many uh, restrictions uh, due to that some of the organizations uh, have to stick to layered architecture but the main problem in the layered architecture layered architecture creates the organization also um, structured in a layered manner and layers are creating gates that is uh, affecting the flow of agility because um, in a layered architecture environment what will happen the wait time of the developers will be higher than uh, the productive time as example in this diagram if the data team required to get some integration done they have to talk to the integration team and if the uh, messaging team required to get uh, their schema uh, placed in the data layer then they have to talk to the data team and it takes time so not only the data team then it will go through the operational team and uh, so sometimes it takes a week to create a schema of a database and killing the productivity so this has changed uh, rapidly with uh, microservices coming into the picture as well as some of the best practices like uh, two pizza teams like amazon call and i call them as self organized teams and some people uh, call them as team of teams many definitions but it's basically autonomous teams that will be working on these uh, specific microservices so the architecture has changed and um, the way these organizations are engaging has changed as well so that is resulting this composable enterprise that you have many moving components compared to the earlier layered and centralized architecture that we saw so this is the major change happened in the architecture world and we are adding different type of uh, sub-architecture -archit patterns to support this as example event-based uh, uh, systems are getting popular because of this uh, modular and remote nature of these uh, components and then um, uh, different type of event related technologies are coming especially uh, in the api layer as example async apis uh, so the uh, supportive components are changing to support this uh, architecture uh, paradigm and then the uh, the another thing happening is everybody wants to uh, go to cloud and then utilize the cloud as well. So uh, if you talk to a chief architect, CTO, or a um, architect even, their main uh, goals are related to or uh, more uh, moving towards uh, with the cloud that uh, organizations are moving to the cloud uh, from uh, on-prem and uh, into a hybrid and then full cloud mode that is uh, something happening uh, shifting um, uh, i mean basically the lifting and then you have to shift these applications as well because you can't run the same monolithic application so applications designed using this uh, traditional way in cloud uh, because then the cost will be really high as well as it will not utilize the cloud properly and you will not get the full benefit out of it so the um, uh, the, that's where the shifting comes and uh, the definitions, there are many definitions for a, a cloud native application and I picked this definition that I like most uh, done by Gregor Hobbs in his book called the, uh, the Cloud Strategy. So if you look at the cloud native application, you will see the application is there which carries the uh, business logic and then there are many surrounding components uh, around that as well to support the application uh, this is mainly because the middleware cannot use as the way we used it in a cloud environment so this is the key point uh, if we go back uh, to the previous slide the architecture has changed from the layered architecture into a more uh, distributed architecture uh, and uh, microservices and uh, event driven architectures are playing a role there and then applications are changing from on-premise into more cloud infrastructure. So you have to utilize the cloud infrastructure and you have to use cloud applications so cloud native applications to run inside this cloud environment. So because of that, the middleware is 
uh, changing and what we have noticed it is uh, basically disappearing into code uh, in a very simpler and construct way and providing more and more power to the code as well as it is disappearing into infrastructure all the scaling management and observability uh, type of related uh, capabilities are moving to the infrastructure so i will repeat it like the middleware is disappearing into two parts one is into code and into infrastructure and it is happening in the long run there are uh, uh, workarounds for now uh, for us to use but in the long run it might not uh, work properly so the first workaround is the sidecar like a lot of uh, uh, microservices uh, uh, related application development using sidecar to have shared state like this network uh, uh, it is uh, so and so forth uh, so the the uh, it's basically you have the application container and then parallel to that you run a sidecar container but if you look at the uh, uh, the supportive components that you require to run a cloud native application there are many so as a result what will happen you might have to include many sidecars to an application and it is not that um, uh, friendly uh, for the infrastructure level as well as to maintenance because uh, if you are getting these features from different uh, libraries or different vendors uh, this is how you will end up and you will uh, hit another issue by running many sidecars for single application. And then the infrastructure level, as I explained, uh, the middleware is uh, moving to some set of uh, uh, infrastructure as well. And Kubernetes is a good example. And if you are a developer who's developing stuff inside Kubernetes, you will see that a lot of uh, capabilities you can utilize from the Kubernetes layer, as well as if you want to share something, you can run it as a Kubernetes server as well. So uh, we have to utilize those capabilities provided by that infrastructure layer as well. So basically, that's where uh, it's happening that the, uh, the middleware is moving some set of stuff into infrastructure. And then if you have to avoid adding many uh, sidecars to your applications, you have to have these capabilities within the uh, language as well. So that's basically inside the code otherwise you will end up with this same problem we have with many shared libraries and let's take a look at how apis connect to this and this is the evolution of the apis happened i think api uh, were there from the beginning a very pure technical apis then it moved to semi-technical apis and then uh, managed apis came in 2011 2012 that's where the uh, recreation or uh, the api management came back into the market and Currently, we are in the API product stage. I was listening to a great keynote in the morning uh, about API products and how you can have a business model behind that. So uh, the uh, if I connect the dots, what's happening now, you have a decentralized architecture, you have many moving components, and uh, you can't use the uh, middleware the way that you used to use. So the API has become the glue now. It is basically replacing the middleware role and connecting these components and sharing capabilities. Now, if you can see in this diagram, there are many moving parts and uh, you will see the API gateways are exposing the capabilities in each and every uh, area of this architecture. And uh, it is not only uh, uh, internal APIs, you can have external APIs, and then there are different type of APIs can come and contribute in this uh, story as well. Request response, event driven, streams, and even I have categorized these APIs into edge domain and utility edge APIs are the APIs that will be consumed by the end use applications like mobile apps and uh, web apps. And then the domain APIs are the one providing domain specific capabilities and utility APIs are the uh, stuff that's providing backend related uh, capabilities using an API. So that is what happening in the uh, distributed architecture as well as how uh, APIs are replacing middleware and then taking that glue or the connect connectivity of uh, different capabilities at the technical level as well as at the business level. 
So uh, uh, if I summarize everything, uh, I repeatedly told this thing. This is the third time I'm repeating it. The middleware is disappearing into code and uh, infrastructure and API has uh, become the glue of this micro component. So as a uh, middleware provider, we identified this for a long time. And uh, as a result, we have done some contribution to the industry as well. Uh, so the first thing is the language called Ballerina. If you uh, would like to take a look, you can go to ballerina.io. It's a cloud native programming language. And the language contains many middleware features as example service is a first class citizen uh, json xml type of uh, communication related messaging uh, uh, message types are uh, first level data types and most of the uh, complicated middleware capabilities are within the language that you can utilize without adding any uh, components. So if you write a service uh, or a microservice using Ballerina or an integration flow using Ballerina, you don't have to engage those sidecars because those capabilities are provided by the um, language itself. Then the second contribution we did for this uh, uh, problem is introducing this platform called Corio uh, because uh, the there are a lot of complexity coming in the uh, infrastructure level. So what we have done in Corio create a platform for you to run Ballerina um, in a very low code cloud native uh, way that uh, you get the textual and uh, graphical uh, parity that you can switch from graphic to code, code to graphic inside Corio, as well as uh, we are making, uh, we are simplifying the Kubernetes as well because it's not that easy to run a Kubernetes cluster. And then some other capabilities like service mesh, uh, control planes, data planes, all these stuff are available inside Corio. And if you like to try Corio, you can uh, try out this, uh, uh, you can try out Corio from this URL. Yeah. Asanka, we yep. uh, thank you very much uh, for the presentation. Uh, we are out of time, and we the, but the slides were so great, we didn't want to cut you for the question apart. Uh, but uh, yeah, so if you have any question for Asanka, don't hesitate to ask them directly uh, in the chat or uh, via social networks or LinkedIn. Uh, thank you again, Asanka, for being with us.